we will never forget the sacrifice that Jesus made for us over 2,000 years ago, way back on Calvary. And that same blood that was shed then, it still works today, and it will never, ever, ever lose its power.
Now we will turn you into the hands of our bishop and my pastor, Bishop Noel Jones. To all of you wonderful people who would be with us on Easter. And uh, it's really interesting. Somebody sent me something that I thought was just a little too funny. But, I, but it speaks to the situation we're in. It says the church is maybe empty on Easter, but certainly the tomb is not empty, and that is the truth. The tomb is not empty, and that's why we're here, not only celebrating the resurrection, but we're also celebrating his death and his burial, because that's all significant in having the resurrection, because there would be no resurrection if there was no death of our Savior, which tells me then that death is prerequisite to and for resurrection. It is not antithetical to it, but it's prerequisite to it. And if I were to use that in a contemporary way, if I were to use it in application to our situation, I would say that many things are going to die and many things are going to be buried that we have been used to, our lifestyles, our attitudes, our disposition, towards God and towards our fellow man, much of that is going to die and be buried, and we're going to rise to walk in not only the newness of life from a spiritual point of view, but the newness of life that has been brought upon us because of the death of our old ways, the burial of our old ways, and the moving into our new ways. Uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are very glad that you have afforded us the privilege to be with you today and with one another in spirit, with one another through this communication method. But we honor you and we're very grateful that you have spared us to this day. And we thank you for all of us who have not been caught into the grasp of this disease. We, we thank you for that. We thank you for those who have recovered. We thank you for those who are on the battlefield up front, working diligently and serving in such a manner that we can only give you thanks for their courage and for their fortitude. Uh, we praise you for those who have gone on, who have had a life with you, those who have been with you in this life, those who have received your salvation. We realize, Lord, that they are now with you and we thank you for their lives. We pray for their families, however, that you will give them peace and consolation. And in such a difficult time when they couldn't even be with their loved ones and the pain that they're going through right now, only you can console. So we just want to give you praise and worship you in everything that we do on this very special day. And we just thank you because we can speak to them out of the pureness of our hearts and uh, give everyone strength now. Uh, the economics is down. We pray that you bless and strengthen everyone through this time. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I want to uh, go to Isaiah just for a few minutes uh, in Isaiah 53, and then a little bit later, I, I want to talk about resurrection. But right now, we want to go to Isaiah 53. Now, as you're finding Isaiah 53, whether on your little device, your phone, your computer, or however you do it, your Bible, uh, as you're looking for that, I, I would like to extend what I regard as the grace of God. And I, I'm going to tell you uh, my take. Uh, I haven't heard it, and maybe this is a little off, uh, but there is a grace of God that has been exhibited in this disease and in this coronavirus. I'm almost wanting to call it a Hispanic coronavirus or a black coronavirus because of how it's just tearing our races apart and our people apart. And it's showing, of course, the great racial divide in America, the financial divide, uh, 
I said this was the year of manifestation. I didn't know that manifestation would be so widespread and so global in its implication. Uh, but I am dealing with the grace of God in th this coronavirus. The grace of God has been exhibited simply because of the timing that he allowed this to take place. Had this taken place 20 years ago, uh, maybe up to 15 years ago, if it had taken place earlier than now, we would not be only separated physically from one another on an Easter Sunday morning. We would not only be separated from our choirs, separated from our music department, our bands, separated from our fellowship with each other, we would not be able to communicate to you on this level at this time. We are separated physically, but we are not separated communicatively because we can reach you through this media. I think we ought to give God thanks for allowing this to come at a time when we are not closed from each other completely, but we can at least through this media touch one another and communicate with each other in a marvelous way. I just thought I'd throw that in for those of us who were seeking something to give God thanks for. I want to say, Lord, we thank you that you did not allow this to come when we would have been in total darkness and cut off completely from one another. We want to thank you for that, for that grace. Uh, that said, in Isaiah 53, of course, verse 1 uh, through and including verse 5, simply says, Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken of God smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. I look at that very carefully and I want to point out uh, that it is by his stripes we are healed. Now, if I may take a little time this morning, there's a remarkable difference, of course, uh, between Isaiah 40 uh, and uh, 1 through 40 and 40 through 66. The writers, of course, have attributed it to two separate works. Uh, they say there are two Isaiahs. Uh, for those of us, of course, who uh, understand the move of God and the fact that God can move in one vessel and change his message totally and completely because the Holy Spirit operates within the parameters of the mind of the prophet and therefore God can, he has the ability certainly to confound our academia uh, with the vastness of his omniscience, he's able to do that. And he can take one person and change their message according to the time in which they live and what God is trying to go after. Uh, this is why the Bible tells us that the natural man, of course, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. God can change the content of the message without changing the messenger or the vessel. 
I, I, I would like to introduce, uh, if you'll allow me to go off the text a minute and, uh, and link something to the text. I have been exploring Isaiah, of course, because I was going to meet with you in the book of Isaiah today. And I looked at Isaiah chapter 1, of course, and uh, no, Isaiah chapter 3, rather, and verse 1. And this is 50 chapters later. And of course, uh, 50 is the number of Jubilee. And uh, I, I would be acegeting if I stretched it any further. Uh, but uh, I'm noting that chapter 3 is a place of judgment. And it seems to be the place where we are now. Chapter 53 is a place of judgment but deliverance. Our judgment in 53 is going to be placed on our Savior, which means it's a chapter of judgment, but the judgment is a judgment that we don't have, but it's a judgment that has been placed on our Savior for our behalf. Don't ever think that grace is grease. Somebody paid the price for the grace that God extends towards you and me. In order for him to extend his grace to you and I, he had to have the justice for the price of sin. So for the price of sin, he allowed his son, or he decreed that his son would take our place. So chapter 53 is also a place of judgment, but the judgment has been deferred to Jesus as a substitute sacrifice for you and I. Now, the judgment in chapter 3 of Isaiah is upon each one of us. And let me note it because it's happening now. Uh, Behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and Judah the stay and the staff. He takes away the whole stay of bread, which means no food, and he takes away the whole stay of water, which means nothing to drink, the sustenance of life. What he's talking about is food and water is the very essence of the sustenance of life. It is the most essential need for man outside of breathing fresh air. Now notice what's happening to us. Our air is contaminated. We are losing our economic balance, which means that he is moving against us economically. The judgment is, and of course, he is moving against us. The judgment is even in the essential things that we need. Now notice, he goes further. He is going to take away the mighty man, the man of war, the judge, the prophet, the prudent, the ancient, the captain of 50, the honorable man, the counselor, the cunning artificer, and the eloquent orator, and I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. Now. If he takes away the essential qualities that we need for life, and if he turns around again, and the judgment takes away our mighty men, our men of war, our judges, our counselors, our prudent people, if he takes away the cunning artificer, that is the person who's able to create marvelous and wonderful things, and if he takes away the eloquent orator, the person who uh, by the euphonious uh, voice can change how you think, if he takes that away, then what he has done is take away essential leadership from among us. When we have no proper leadership, it's a judgment. Then he turns around and says, a child shall rule. And this will bring oppression. Now, in the literal translation of Isaiah chapter 3, he is saying that children will become king. Who was the king after Hezekiah? Manasseh. 
Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to rule. And later, after Manasseh for Reformation, came Josiah, and he was eight years old when he began to rule. Now, if I were to apply that to our day, what I would say to you is that we have rulers who are not 12 years old and eight years old, but they act like it. Anytime a child is always, you know, a child and a, a child at a very young age, children are extremely narcissistic. Here is when they discover that they're different from you. When they say, mine, mine. It seems to me as if we are being ruled by people who are only concerned about what's theirs. That's the judgment of chapter three. The relief of chapter three is chapter 53. And I will tell you this, that this prophet Isaiah, the length of his prophecy and reign was over four kings and at least five. Uzziah was one, Jotham was another that we know for sure, Ahaz was another, Hezekiah for sure, and probably the reign of Manasseh, which of course is considered in Israel just before impending exile. The quality of life under that kind of leadership had become debilitated, uh, yes, dilapidated, and very definitely devastated. And only one of those five kings were godly. And of course, Isaiah, undaunted by their behavior, here's what he said. Is it a small thing for you to weary men? Must you weary God also? So life in Israel is a little bit like it is now. It became deplorable practically because if you're in a theocratic government and uh, politically, socially, and spiritually, and uh, you ignore the theocracy that is significant for your blessings, there can be no substitute lifestyle if one is not spiritual in a theocratic environment. So Isaiah now has the very unpleasant task of having to address Israel's behavior on the high social level, on the low social level, on every border of their life. So what does he do? He denounces what we need to denounce today. We need to denounce injustice as he did. He denounced oppression. He announced their grasping covetousness. He denounced their insatiable sensuality. He denounced their pride and haughtiness. Uh, but these uh, is done uh, not to curry favor of the masses. He declares the city a faithful city has become an harlot. No longer do we operate within the things of God because the people now are laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, the children that are corruptors. And it's interesting because then he moves into their overt hypocrisy. I mean, this sounds like us. He, he say they all draw near to the Lord with their mouth. And with their lips they honor him, but their hearts are far from him. They have removed their hearts. They, they, I mean, they, they speak the things that are wonderful. They talk about him in no uncertain terms. They brag about their relationship with him. But Isaiah says it's just overt hypocrisy. They are a rebellious people. They are lying children, children that will not hear the voice of God. Now, there is no avoidance then of God's judgment because you cannot walk outside of theocratic principles and expect to be blessed. You cannot walk outside of what God has ordained and God has ordered and be in a position as if you have been walking with him. You cannot not walk with God and receive the benefits of having walked with him. And that's Satan's favorite ploy. Satan's favorite ploy, because he knows he can't attack us from the outside, 
He attacks us from the inside. He doesn't come with battalions of angels to knock us out of that place with God because he, he can't master God from that point of view. But what he does is he likes to contaminate the child of God and then he knows God has to judge. If he can get in, make hypocrites out of us, give us that sweet talking tongue towards God, but a heart that's removed from him, talk about how we love the Lord and, and how all God is operating in our government. And at the same time, we're full of injustice. We oppress people. We talk about being uh, pro-life and yet still we're pro-life only before people are born. But once we're born, uh, then everybody's trying to kill certain people in our community. And uh, I mean, really, and yet we declare we are the children of God. Isaiah knew this. And so Isaiah knew that the bill of living that kind of life away from God has to be paid. You cannot live outside of the principles of God and not understand that the bill of living outside of his principle has to be paid. And so there were many little payments, of course. The five kings in Isaiah, except for Hezekiah, they had little payments to make. And they made little payments, I guarantee you they did. But they had a balloon payment coming. And that balloon payment was Nebuchadnezzar and 70 years of exile. And that's what Isaiah was preaching to them so vehemently and bulliantly about. He was declaring the fact that if we keep living outside of the principles of God, we're going to fall in the hand of an enemy that could never destroy us if we weren't weakened by the way we live. So in spite of the uncompromised sternness, in spite of the zealous protection of God's honor, Isaiah was still remarkably tender. There was a tenderness because he had a strong compassion for the people of God. He had an exceptional sensitivity towards those who fell into God's judgment. Jerusalem, and, uh, oh my God, uh, like Jesus, uh, Isaiah detests sin, but he mourns the fate of the sinner. He weeps bitterly. He refuses comfort. In one place he says, because of the spoiling of the daughter of my people, because now his loins are filled with pain. He hates sin as God does, but he doesn't hate the sinner. Israel would not respond to Isaiah's message. His heart is broken. His spirit is frustrated. His ministry is stymied. His compassion excruciating. But Israel will not hear. So the Assyrian struggle is over, but now they are about to face a payment that is beyond their capacity to handle without God's grace. Babylon then becomes the rod of God's anger and the staff of indignation. So Isaiah must face and accept the sentence that they're going to go into exile. What do we need? Is there no victory? How shall he, we be healed? Is there a ministry to break sin's yoke? So here's what God does. Because of Isaiah's passion and because of Isaiah's love for Israel, God now takes his ministry from the contemporary environment that he was speaking to in speaking to a group of people who would not hear him. And God jettisons his vision all the way in chapter 53 to a total different scene. Might I quote what one writer says? One writer says this, he says, the familiar scenes and faces among which he has hitherto lived and labored hath grown dim and disappeared. All sounds of the present are hushed and move him no more. 
the present has died out of the horizon of his soul's vision, unquote. What God did was shut Israel off from the vision of Isaiah. That's why Isaiah is called the eagled eye prophet. Because what God did was shut his vision off from a group of people who would not honor the Lord their God, would not honor Elohim or Jehovah, would not honor him in all of his manifest manifestative expressions, would not honor the Jehovah Nisi, the Jehovah Jireh, the Jehovah Makadish, the Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Rofika, Jehovah Roa. They would not honor the God that brought them out of Egypt. They would not honor the God that told them, if you follow me, none of these diseases would come upon you. So he jettisons Isaiah and he opens a new door for his ministry. No longer judgment because of sin's debt. He now shows us that sin's debt is going to be paid through Jesus Christ, one man. He's going to show us that Jesus is ready to heal the world through faith. So what then has happened? Isaiah saw him in Gethsemane. God jettisoned him all the way to Gethsemane. And he shows him that there's no sacrifice of this magnitude that can be done without an initial preparation period. That's why he takes him to Gethsemane. And in Gethsemane now, what we have is Jesus' mental and emotional state now was so depressed and drastically broken under the enormity of the job before him and the complexity of the job that the Lord had placed on him. And it was so complex and it was so intense that the humanity and the divinity was at war within the boundaries of one individual. The job was so enormous that there was a clash between his humanity and his divinity. Mark declared it when Mark said that he was terrified so much. Mark says he called it, he was sore amazed. And this is, he was terrified. He was terrified so much so that he produced bloody sweat. In medical terms, hemohydrosis. Hemohydrosis is the hemorrhage in the sweat glands that now are caused because of his psychological dilemma. The psychological debilitation was so intense that it influenced what his body was doing. So instead of having sweat come out of his sweat glands, he had hemohydrosis or a bloody sweat. The bloody sweat now has caused his tender, his skin to become tender and fragile, this bloody sweat, because now it's not much blood loss, but because of the condition of him psychologically and his body now being turned upside down, he ends up now having chills in his body because of the cold night air. Isaiah saw him arrested later that night at midnight, tried from 1 a.m. to daybreak in the Jewish court. Five hours he was there with hemohydrosis, with his, ten, his skin fragile and tender. And that's why Isaiah wrote and penned it so explicitly, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. The Sadducees and the Pharisees found him guilty of blasphemy. And I'm telling you this, if his body was not healthy, it would not have become such an object of torture for so long. The healthiness of his body surely made the torture even greater because had he been weaker, he would have been gone quickly because of what he had gone through. So his body becoming, because it was so healthy, caused him to have even more pain over a longer period of time 
And that's why the very chastisement of our peace was upon him. If he did not go through what he went through, we could not have peace today in going through what we went through. At daybreak, the Jewish guards took him. After being five hours under questioning with the Sadducees and Pharisees in the Sanhedrin court, in the morning, the Jewish guards took him and blindfolded him, spat upon him, struck him in his face. And at 9 p.m., remember, 9 p.m. Thursday night until daybreak, he experienced hemohydrosis. Let me get this mic, excuse me for a minute. Uh, hemohydrosis. Now, these are some of the things you can't do in the pulpit. You can't take a break, pick up a mic or anything like that. You have to act as if nothing is happening. But I'm home and uh, I'm glad I can talk to you. So excuse me, but I am home. Uh, experience. Now, remember now, 9 p.m. Thursday till daybreak. He experiences hemohydrosis. He's abandoned by his closest friends and his disciples. He's had a sleepless and a traumatic night. He's convicted by the Jewish court. Now notice he's being talked to by men who are totally inferior to him. Yet he put on the form of a servant. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Put on the form of a servant, humbled himself humbled himself until he allowed men who he created to treat him with such indignity so that he might be able to bring the salvation and the deliverance from the judgments that we are now facing. Notice, he was blindfolded, spat upon, struck in the face, then he had to walk a mile and a half to Pilate's court. Pilate's court, because Pilate now is the praetorium of the fortress of Antonia, which is the residential and governmental seat of Pontius Pilate, who now happens to be the procurator of Judea. Jesus is not represented to Pilate now as a blasphemer. Because Pilate isn't concerned about religious opposition. He's only concerned about political and governmental opposition. So Pilate now is appointed to deal with the Roman authority. And Jesus is now accused as the appointed king to undermine the authority that Pilate has been set to watch over. Pilate made no charges. So what Pilate did now was send him to Herod. Herod made no charges and sent him back to Pilate. So here now after, after having suffered hemohydrosis, after having been abandoned by his closest friends, after having a sleepless and traumatic night, after having been convicted by less than his group, less than his level, after having been blindfolded, spat upon, struck in the face, his skin already being tender, after having walked a mile and a half to Pilate, now he's got to walk miles to Herod, miles back to Pilate, and now he is still not convicted. Pilate could find no evidence to convict him. But the people insisted he be turned over for scourging and for crucifixion. Now, isn't it interesting? He came unto his own and his own knew him not. Then they received him not. But I'm so glad that to them who believed, he gave power to become the sons of God. He is now being rejected by the same people he healed the same people he raised from the dead, the same people he fed, he's being rejected. Now he's left with an instrument called the flagrum. 
they're going to whip him unmercifully. It is a short whip with several braided thongs, leather thongs of variable lengths. And on the leather thongs are sharp pieces of sheep bones and iron balls. He is stripped naked, his back is turned, and he is whipped all the way down from his neck, all the way down through his buttocks, all the way down to his legs, and he's flogged by two soldiers. The iron balls and the sheep bones would cut into the skin and the subcutaneous tissue. And as the whipping continued, the lacerations would tear into the underlying muscles and produce ribbons of bleeding flesh. He is now being broken for us. The pain and the blood loss would, I mean, it would set the stage for circulatory shock. And this is why the writer Isaiah declares he was wounded for our transgression. Notice how systematically they began to break him. Notice how systematically from 9 p.m. on Thursday night, they began to break his body down. And because he was healthy and because he was strong, it became such an awful torture. And every time they broke his body down, they were releasing life for me. They were releasing life for you. As they were breaking his body down, the Romans spat upon by the Jewish soldiers, but now he is turned to the Roman soldiers who are the Praetorium Guard. Now remember, the Jewish soldiers beat him up, Sanhedrin. But now he's turned over to the Praetorium Guard. Another set of guards have him now. They mock him with a robe over his shoulders because now he is being charged with undermining Roman authority as the king. So now the guards have put a robe on him to mock him as being a king. Then they put a crown of thorns on his head and they press the crown the, the, of thorns into his head. So now he's bleeding from around his head. They put a staff in his hand as a scepter. And that now is to mock him even further. They spat on him, hit him on his head. And that's when Isaiah, looking as the eagle eye prophet, he penned, he was despised and rejected of men. At this point now, he had pre-shock Stage. He was in a pre-stock stage without a doubt. Skin rendered soft by hemohydrosis. Scourged unmercifully with deep wounds. No sleep, no food, no water. I mean, he was tortured in such a way that you and I ought to praise him every day for what he has done to deliver us from our sins. And that same power is going to deliver us from this disease. By now he has physical and mental abuse by both the Roman and the Jewish soldiers. He has no friends. He has now still some more to go because crucifixion began among the Persians. Alexander the Great introduced crucifixion to Egypt and to Carthage. The Romans learned it from the Carthaginians and the Romans now respond used it as a form of torture, designed it to be a slow death with maximum pain and suffering. That's what they did. One writer puts it like this. It was one of the most disgraceful and cruel methods of execution and usually was reserved only for slaves, foreigners, revolutionaries, and the vilest of criminals, unquote. That's why Paul said, 
he humbled himself not only to be subjected to the disposition and attitude of men, but he humbled himself to death, even, even the death of the cross. They put the patibulum or the crossbar on his neck. That means they laid it in the nape of his neck so it would be balanced. Not the whole cross, but the patibulum of the cross. And if you have a cross at home, you can take a look at it and see it. Uh, I have a cross that I want to show you, but uh, of course, we brought this wonderful cross, this beautiful looking cross. Look at it. Isn't it just marvelous? Uh, this is something that sits on somebody's desk and represents something that's beautiful and wonderful, but it was nothing like this. It is nothing like that gold cross you had. It was just trees with the barks, with everything. They took one limb and nailed it to another, and that was the cross. It had all kind of spikes in it. Now, the condemned man had to carry the patibulum, which is the cross member alone. Uh, he was already weak. The entire cross weighed about 300 pounds, but the patibulum, which was placed in the nape of his neck, balanced between both shoulders and, of course, uh, tied to the outstretched arms, it weighed between 75 and 125 pounds. He is already weak, but then they give him help. Thank God for Simon at the sight of the crucifixion. He is now going to help Jesus. Now, they're not helping him because they're in love with him. They're helping him because they want to hurry up and get it over with before the Sabbath day. And uh, he is now, by law, he would, we should receive a bitter drink of wine mixed with myrrh as a mild analgesic. But Jesus wouldn't take it. He wouldn't take it because he wanted to feel the sin of every single one of us and the full extent of how it ravishes the human being. He wanted to feel the sin of the prostitute who's trying to come out of the life of prostitution. He wanted to feel the pain that she had while she was in it and the pain that she has trying to get out of it. She wanted to feel the pain of the drug addict who with drugs ravishing his body and him being so mentally debilitated that he wants to get out of drugs, but the power of the drugs has him bound so awfully. And he wanted to feel the withdrawals that the drug addict and the alcoholic goes through when he's trying to get out of it. He wanted to feel the call of it that's calling him back into that life that he's trying to get out of and the struggle that the individual has trying to become better. He wanted to feel the murderer's feeling of guilt after he has become convicted and has come to the place where he is now sorrow, sorry for his actions. He wanted to feel what the wife abuser uh, feels when he is tired and sick of his attitude towards his wife and his children and his family. And when she is tired of the abuse that she has given to his, uh, her children and even to her own husband, it goes both ways. He wanted to feel what every one of us feels when we want to get the load of sin off our back. So he refused it. Now they laid him out. And what they did was they nailed him with seven inch spikes and they nailed him between the carpal and the radius bone and they severed the median nerve and that's now when they began to squeeze the very blood out of his body. He is intense agony, multiple causes of death, the stimulated nerve that of course that the median nerve, every time you take a breath and, oh my God, his lungs would fill. He would move his hand. And when he moved his arms, the nail against the nerve would send fire through his body. And I will tell you the reason we're not going to hell and the reason why even if we die in the midst of this disease, hell will not be our home. They nailed him between the intermetatarsal space of the foot, cut the peroneal nail, 
and sent fire. Fire came up and down through his body. The nerve roots were shattered. The pain was excruciating beyond our imagination. And the Bible said his very visage was marred in such a way that even though he was without form or comeliness, he now became a bleeding mass of protoplasm. He was abused completely, cruelly. Every breath aggravated the wounds from the scourging and the scraping against the splintered filled cross. Every breath would bring the rotation of the wrists and feet on the spikes as heavy breathing continues. Each respiratory effort would become agonizing and tiring and eventually it would lead to asphyxiation. Now, the muscle cramps from the outstretched arm, man, I mean, the blood is being squeezed out of him. He's chilled from blood loss. He probably could have died from hypovolemic shock. The doctor said he could have died from exhaustive asphyxia. He could have died from dehydration. He could have died from stress-induced arrhythmia. He could have died from congestive heart failure. He could have died, of course, from the spare in his side. He was already dead. But the truth is he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. And as I close, I will tell you that our sins killed him. Our attitudes killed him. Our greed killed him. Our flesh and love to satisfy the flesh killed him. Our sicknesses killed him. Everything that is anti-God, ungodly and wicked, that's what killed him and squeezed the blood out of his body. When they pierced him in his side, he was already dead, but out came blood and water because the, perio, the pericardial sac had been broken. And every time that he suffered and was broken and the blood was squeezed out of his body, it meant strength and life for me. So when I look back at Calvary, I honor him and I praise him and I give him glory and I worship him because if I never get another car, another house, if I go by way of this disease, if I go by way of death, I have an assurance in the assurance that the blood has not lost his power. And so what he said to us and to all of you who are viewing, what he said to us, he said, as oft as you do this, do it in memory of me. Remember me, because as my body crumbled, Satan's kingdom crumbled. And so as he sat with his disciples, he sat with them on that marvelous day, and he so wonderfully said to them, in Matthew 26, 26, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and he blessed it. And that bread, of course, represents his body. And as he took that bread that was broken, he said to them, take, eat, this is my body. And he prayed over it. He said, eat, this is my body. I want you to bow your heads wherever you are. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you now and we thank you because of Calvary. We thank you because of the blood that you shed. We thank you because they broke your body into pieces. And today, in the middle of the crisis that we faced, we look at this great event and we say, thank you. Thank you. Because what you did on Calvary's cross has fixed us through this great cataclysmic extirpation, whether we live or die. 
where they takes us out or we have the testimony that we were sick and you healed us, whether we have the testimony that we didn't receive it or whether we see you in glory. It is this single event that has made it possible for us to be able to praise you in any option with any situation. And we just want to thank you right now. So as we receive your body, let it move through us, heal our spirits, our souls, and give us hope and expectation that this too that we're going through will pass. And as we take this today, for those who have lost loved ones, let this be a reassurance and a confirmation that it is not over yet because you are the resurrection and the life. In Jesus' name, amen. Receive the body of our Lord and Savior. Oh, you can praise him right where you are. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Not to buy a new car, he didn't do this for me to have a bigger house, to have more clothes. He didn't do this for me to be able to buy Louboutin and Charles Jardin and Gucci, Tom Ford. He didn't do this for me to buy Christian, Clive Christian Cologne and Bodacia, the victorious Cologne. He didn't do that for me. He did this for the remission of sins. That if in this life only we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. He did it to remove that from my vocabulary. He did it to show me that I want you with me for eternity. But he did declare by his stripes we are healed. There is power in his blood. So wherever you are as a child of God, wherever you are on the spectrum, wherever you are and whatever level of situation you're in today, this blood has its power to bring you to the place where you can declare, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. Father, we thank you for the power of the blood. And we pray right now that this blood will move in every circumstance, in every situation. Because you declared, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Pass over every one of us in every situation of house that we are in. Whatever is in our particular house, we have put your blood on the door. So we thank you for deliverance and for healing. We thank you for comfort and consolation. We thank you for economic recover. We thank you for all of our brothers and sisters, wherever they are, as we unite together in spirit. We thank you for the fellowship of the saints that you will restore. And we thank you for this time that we have to grow with you. And we praise you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. The blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, receive. There is power in the blood. There is power in the blood. Let's worship him now in song. Let's worship him. Let's give him glory. City of Refuge, wherever you are, 
Let's worship. You are the church. Take the church with you. To whoever's watching abroad, Japan, China, South Korea, Spain, Italy, Germany, Brazil. There is healing. There is healing. There is healing. Oh, there is healing. There is healing. There is healing. There is a bomb in Gil. to know that our Savior just provided everything for us in such a way that we can worship and praise him in spite of what we're going through. Now, it didn't end on the cross because today represents the resurrection and today represents the completion of the Easter event, the completion of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this means now that death is not contradistinctive to resurrection. It is not antithetical. It is not a force that's against it. Death is a prerequisite for resurrection. So now in the middle of this coronavirus, in this middle 
of this cataclysmic extirpation in the middle of what we're facing right now, what has happened is everything has manifested itself in such a manner that, and I declared this year was a year of manifestation, and I just did not know that in manifestation it would be so complete and so overwhelming, actually, because we now take a good look at ourselves, we take a good look at the projects and programs we've been operating in the name of the Lord. We now take a good look at our country, our government. We take a good look at what we have been doing as people to enhance and embellish not only the spiritual lives of the children of God, but to embellish our way of life in terms of our eating, in terms of our health. We, 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 we have had a lot of things to die because of the manifestation that has come this year. We, so much has manifested itself, the way we treat each other, the injustice, the divide between the rich and the poor, the lack of medical attention, of health uh, care, the significance of the things that we thought was not important, the manifestation of the power of the God that we serve, who's able to help us to operate even in times that are difficult, the manifestation of the weakness that we have projected in our preaching to the people of God when we have only focused on material things and having a wonderful life here and we have not preached to them the power that God gives even in the middle of famine and difficult times. Uh, everything has been manifested and many of what has been manifested has got to die. It's not antithetical to resurrection. What God is saying to us now is I have shown you some things that you have to bury because they're now dead to you. And this means that when we rise out of this, we will walk in the newness of life. People are saying right now that this is a new norm. No, this is not a new norm, this is abnormal. The new norm will come after we're resurrected because after we come out of this, then we will be forced to walk in a new way with a new attitude towards our brothers, a new attitude towards money and material things, a new attitude towards our salvation, a new attitude towards the fact that God has given us an insurance, that God has given us eternal life, a new attitude towards how quickly we operate in depression when we have the power of the Holy Spirit and the promise of God that if I go, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. I am the resurrection and I am the life. A new walk with God will include the fact that he has taken us now from the ephemeral to the eternal he is showing us that I'm not only limited to blessing you in this life, but I have a new life for you. So for those of us who are getting up in age, he is saying to us, number your days. He is saying to us, understand the rhythm of life. Understand you're here for a season. Understand you're a pilgrim passing through and live your life like that. Don't love the world, neither the things that are in the world, because what you love, where your heart is, that's where your treasures are. And that's why you're so afraid of death. I am resurrecting a new group of people. When they come up out of this, they will be new. They will be powerful. They will be more anointed. They will be greater servants of mine and better servants of the people in the world who are not even in the church. I am going to spread my love all over this world in the same way that this disease has infected the world. I am going to affect the world through my people that I'm going to make them in infectious, their joy infectious, their peace infectious, their long suffering infectious, their kindness infectious, their gentleness infectious, their temperance infectious. I'm going to let every gift of the Holy Ghost operate through them as they rise out of the death and burial of the things that have kept them from being all that I want them to be. I have come to tell you on this Easter day that you are going to be a new person in the Lord Jesus Christ after he have put us through the fire of his refining factory. And this is what this has been, a year of manifestation to bring us to a place of growth and power, 
not to a place of devastation, but a place of felicity and power in him. And I just believe that this is what it's all about. I want to pray before I go further. Father, we receive your hand in our life and we thank you for the new me that is already emerging and for the new people of God that you are already sanctifying. I thank you for what you're going to do in us, through us, and for us. And I speak it and declare it in Jesus' name. Amen. To the children of the city, I have some announcements. Our security, uh, Charles Jackson's family, we must pray for them. The family of Pastor PG, put them on your prayer list. On Friday night, when my prayer team comes together again, when the prayer ministry comes together under uh, Pastor uh, Haniel Yosef, when that comes together, we are going to pray for uh, Charles' family. We're going to pray for PG's family. We're going to pray for everyone who has lost a loved one and for those who are battling the virus right now. We're praying for those on the front line. I heard a terrible story yesterday. A young man is working as one of the essential workers and the company told him, if you want to wear a mask, you got to buy it. And so I'm going to provide a mask for him and for, uh, you know, just reach out to the church and we'll do whatever we can. For those of you who are on the front line, we'll do whatever we can to make sure that you're covered on your jobs. If they won't cover it, we'll cover it. So we're praying for those who are on the front line, those essential workers who we have just discovered, just been made manifest by what we're going through. We're praying for you. Uh, we're going to do some black, some classics later. We're going to, uh, at four o'clock, we're just going to throw in just a series of messages, one after the other, so you can have all the church you want. So if you go to any one of our sites, uh, I will host Back Down Memory Lane Marathon, featuring messages from the series, God's Gonna Make You Laugh. You had to go through it. This is your time. I had to take it. God's going to make you laugh. The fire won't go out. That's from the series, God's going to make you laugh. And those are the messages that are there. Our 12 noon Bible class on Wednesday, the Lord willing, I will be chatting with everyone on Facebook. Our Facebook page is the City of Refuge, Los Angeles. You can also submit your questions. Uh, social media at City of Refuge Los Angeles org. I will say that again. Social media at City of Refuge Los Angeles org. If you want to get ahead of that, ahead of us on Wednesday, submit your questions to social media at City of Refuge Los Angeles org. Wednesday, we're going to interact with each other during our noon Bible class. Revival, remember that today. Download it. We are on a safer at home order from our government. So we're bringing the movie to you. Download the movie, watch it today. Have a wonderful time enjoying that movie. I want you and your family to check it out. All the information and links will be available on our social sites. Everything that you need will be on our social sites and again, we're saying glory to God for allowing us to have this kind of situation when we have this medic, this kind of technology that will help us to reach you where you are. For those of you who are not born again and you're listening to us, I pray that when this is over, you will come and you will say to us at the City of Refuge and to churches, wherever you are, men and brethren, what shall we do? to be saved and we will tell you what to do and we will help you to operate in the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ through repentance, baptism in his name for there is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit 
and then you will walk in the newness of life. Accept him, receive him as your savior, and then come and declare to us, men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? And we will be with you through the process. God bless you today. God bless you. I'm looking for you on Wednesday. I'm looking for you to pick up our line for the telephone prayer on Friday night. Look at our sites and you will find the link to that very special prayer. It's sustaining us, it's keeping us, and it's holding us in such a time. God bless you and heaven smile upon you. Now when it comes to giving, I must remember to tell you that you can give on our sites. I haven't pressed it, I haven't pushed it, because all of us are at a loss right now in direct proportion to our financial obligation and our fiscal responsibilities. All of us are at a loss. So whatever God has blessed you to give, you give it, give it out of your love for him. I'm not going to get into any exegetical presentation that stimulates your giving. You love the Lord. You know how good he's been to you. You know what you can do and how you can sustain the house of the Lord. So you will be sustained and we will be sustained. Operate in the wisdom of the principles of economics that govern your house and understand that there is a natural move and a supernatural move. There's anointing with obedience and anointing with obedience comes together and all of us will be blessed and sustained. This is a time for survival and survival will lead us into a greater and more fruitful life. We're gonna to survive to thrive. God bless you, I'm out.